All right, folks, in this session, we're gonna spend some time talking about some new chest pain guidelines that you've got to know about. And we'll start out with a quick case. You have a 55-year-old man who comes to the emergency department complaining of some chest pain for about 20 minutes, and it's relatively low risk. The patient has some mid-sternal chest pain. There's no diaphrasis or radiation, but there is some shortness of breath and some nausea, and now he's feeling a little bit better. His EKG shows just some NSJ, nonspecific junk. So what's your plan with this patient? It's not a slam dunk admission, is it? But it's also not somebody that you're gonna to feel totally comfortable sending the patient home. This is the classic low risk type of ACS concern that you have. Let's say you're not worried about PE, you're not worried about dissection, you have some concerns about acute coronary syndrome. Well, just a few months ago, in November 2021, the AHA, the ACC, the ASC, CHEST, S, I don't even know what all these initials stand for, but a lot of big societies came out and they published this guideline that I think we all have to know about, and it focuses on these relatively low-risk patients. It's a 99-page novel of a document focused on low-risk chest pain. Now. I and a couple of my colleagues went through this entire document, and I think after we were done, we kind of felt a little bit like this, but we're gonna save you the trouble of having to go through all of this and just focus in on some of the key points that you've gotta know. And there weren't that many groundbreaking things, but there are just a few key points that we're gonna summarize in the next few minutes about this particular document. First of all, you need to be wary of the words that patients use. Sometimes people, people say chest pain. Sometimes people say chest pressure, squeezing, tightness. People use all kinds of words. People sometimes use the word sharp. The traditional literature has said that sharp implies lower risk, pressure implies higher risk. Well, recent literature has shown that none of those words really portend an increase or a decrease likelihood for ruling in for ACS. So, you can't put too much stock in the words the patients use. And one of the things that they recommend is ask the patients about chest discomfort rather than tightness or squeezing. We've all been there where we ask Mr. Jones, rate your pain on a scale of zero to 10. And he says, I don't have any pain, it's just discomfort, right? We've been there. So what they recommend doing is using the term discomfort rather than asking about pain. They also emphasize the importance of doing a good history of present illness. And this is the mnemonic that I've taught an entire generation of medical students to use when they're doing the history of present illness. It's old car. What does old car stand for? Well, it's onset, location, duration, character. Is it sharp, dull, squeezing, pressure? Go ahead and ask those questions. What makes the pain better? What alleviates the pain? What makes the pain worse? What aggravates the pain? What were you doing when the patient's pain began? The activity and onset. Associated symptoms, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, diaphrasis, and then ask the pain, and then ask the patient about whether the patient's pain radiates to one side or to another. They also talk about the very important point of acute coronary syndrome occurring in women. And we've talked about this at this conference before. And what they validate is that women are at higher risk. We unfortunately have a gender bias about ACS in women. If you probably went to a medical school like mine, you probably learned an age old myth that Women don't have ACS until they're about 65, and we now know that that's completely wrong. Women can have ACS in their 30s, in their 40s, sometimes even in their 20s. So you've got to think about ACS even in relatively younger women. Now, women still usually do have chest pain, but oftentimes, probably more often than men, they have alternative symptoms like shortness of breath, isolated or unexplained nausea and vomiting, diaphoresis for no good reason, or in elderly women in particular, weakness or fatigue for no good reason. So ask about those symptoms and take them into account when you're working up these patients. And unfortunately, the literature has shown that women are less likely to get timely workups and also less aggressive treatments. There tends to be this gender bias. We also have known that elderly are at high risk for ACS, but they have very atypical symptoms as well. Elderly often don't have any chest pain. And so you need to consider ACS when elderly come in with mental status changes for no good reason or upper abdominal pain without tenderness, that's a key thing. Any upper abdominal pain without tenderness, you've got to think about thoracic problems. I always teach our residents, the diaphragm's not a concrete wall. Anything in the chest can produce abdominal pain and also vice versa. So if they have upper abdominal pain without much tenderness, think about that EKG, get a chest X-ray, think about the aorta and so on. And also, 
unexplained falls. There's some literature out there saying that anywhere from 10 to 20% of elderly with unexplained falls may be having a cardiac reason for their fall. So think again about getting that EKG early in those particular patients that come in with an unexplained fall. They've also found that there's racial and ethnic disparities that occur in terms of the workups of patients as well. Blacks, Hispanics, South Asians tend to get less aggressive workups and treatments, and as a result, they end up with higher morbidity and mortality. The same has been found true for Medicaid and uninsured patients, and this national document recommends cultural competency training and a greater awareness because of the unconscious bias. They talk about lesions involving the left circumflex, the RCA, and the posterior wall. These can be very difficult to diagnose because posterior MIs can hide from you. In fact, studies have shown that posterior infarctions are probably the most commonly missed type of MI, and we'll talk more about that in a different lecture. But in this document, what they say is have a low threshold to get posterior leads on these patients. When there's any ST depression in your anterior leads, especially V1, V2, V3, get your posterior leads, and you might be surprised that you pick up an isolated posterior STEMI. What else do they talk about in this document? Well. They bring up the point that patients with low risk for ACS, generally speaking, if their risk for ACS is less than 1% major adverse cardiac event in 30 days, these patients do not need an urgent workup. They can be discharged without recommendations for that stress test in the next few weeks or so. They're at sufficiently low risk that if you get a stress test, your likelihood of a false positive exceeds the likelihood of a true positive. So you may actually be doing harm to these patients by working them up. On the other hand, if they have intermediate or high risk, those are the patients you want to work up. And then they endorse the use of the heart score, the EDAC score, and other accelerated diagnostic protocols. This is Barbara Backus you're looking at. She's a former speaker here at the Essentials Conference as well. Once again, there's no good evidence to support the benefit of stress testing or cardiac imaging of these patients within 30 days of their ED visit if they end up having low risk based on the heart score or the EDAX or any of those other accelerated diagnostic protocols. Now, one of the other things that they mention in this is that if they have intermediate risk, those are the patients that do need to get some type of workup. Now, what workup do you do? Well, they kind of hedge on this a little bit. They say if they're under 65 and or they're less likely to have obstructive disease, you probably ought to get a coronary CTA. If they're over 65 and have more obstructive disease, in those patients, go ahead with stress testing. And if the result you get from either of these is equivocal, then you go ahead and get the next, the other test as an alternative. And then they talk about warranties. And this is, I have to admit, one section that I really didn't like. What do they mean warranties? Do you get your money back if somebody dies? Do they replace the heart with no money down? You know, I, I hate this concept of warranties because the fact is in healthcare, there are never any warranties or guarantees, but they do provide some information that's probably a bit useful. What they say is that if a patient has a completely clean angiogram, not just mild abnormalities, but totally clean angiogram, then that gives you probably about a two-year warranty. Again, take that with a grain of salt because there are no true warranties, but it's very unlikely extremely unlikely that a patient's gonna go on to have an MI or coronary disease over the next two years. Similarly, if somebody has a totally clean coronary CTA, then that portends a very low risk at two years as well. Now, one of the other things that they put in here is that if somebody has a normal recent stress test, then that also portends a low risk over the next six months. And I'll put my opinion here that uh, I don't think that's true. We've gone over a lot of data in the past indicating that somebody can have a completely normal stress test and still the next day have a heart attack. So just be careful about over-relying on somebody who comes in with a concerning story who's got the recent negative stress test. They, in fact, in this document themselves indicate that anywhere from 6 to 15% of patients with troponin-positive ACS can have ACS even in the absence of any obstructive coronary disease. So the bottom line is there are no guarantees. So those are the key points from this 99-page document, and I hope you're able to take these recommendations and implement them in your practice.